I'm here with Lamin Abdul Malik, uh, who's based out in Vienna, in Austria, who's dressed very sharply um, <laughs> and <laughs> studied, I believe, at one point, uh, studied fashion design. Is that right, Lamin? Um, yes, in my in my bedroom. Yes, I, I did. I wanted to be a in your bedroom. <laughs> well, we're all great <laughs> project art. So. We're going to talk. I met Lamine. I say I met Lamine. We we contacted each other uh, on the internet. I, I saw your beautiful website uh, from Coffee with Love and was immediately jealous of the of the name of the domain, thinking, why wasn't I creative enough to come up with something like that? You know, I call my website Bar Talks and you're from Coffee with Love. I mean, that immediately <laughs> shows a, 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 a detail on style that you've got. And I was reading your story and, you know, I think they say the average time on a website is six seconds or two seconds or something. So if you can engage somebody for more than a few seconds, apparently you've done incredibly well. And I stayed on your website for a long time reading your, reading your, your story. And it was fascinating. It was so engaging. I, I reached out to you and I immediately asked if you would, if you would talk to me and and tell your story because i think it's something worth worth talking about and then we got chatting and we ended up rambling on as as i tend to do um about philosophy a little bit and tying philosophy and coffee together so this is going to be maybe a little bit of a slightly different uh interview i know it's going to be different because you're an entirely different person from anyone else that i've interviewed um but we're going to talk a little bit about your story in fact, we'll talk as much about your story as you like, because it's such an interesting one. And if there's time at the end, we're going to touch upon a little bit about the philosophy and how that ties in with the coffee industry. How does that sound? That sounds great, Nick. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so you're British born? Um, yeah, I'm half British, half Nigerian. Right. And where did you grow up? You grew up in England, though, right? Um, well, I actually started off in Nigeria. So I was in, I lived in Nigeria for the first 12 years of my life. Ah. And then um, my dad actually got a job in Austria. So we left Nigeria when I was 12. And um, talking about purpose, when I was younger, I used to always watch all these kiddie programs from, from England. And I thought, oh, it would be, really, be really nice if I went to boarding school in England. I thought, that's never going to happen. But then when we moved, my, I think my mom and my dad said to me, Oh, you can have you can have your dream now. You can actually go to boarding school in England. And I was like, <laughs> so that was that's how we actually left Nigeria. My dad got a job in um, I think nineteen eighty four. So I, I left Nigeria. Wow. Yeah. Nineteen eighty four. Yes. <laughs> what were hair like then? I have to put a picture up. Send me a picture. Send me a photo of you with your hair. I'm I'm a big fan of people's hair and clothing of the nineteen eighties. It's all shamefully put away into photo albums now, but I think we should drag them out and force people to uh, to display them. Actually, I actually have one on my phone, so I can. I've got your WhatsApp number, so I can actually share that with you if you really want. I've got one. <laughs> I've got one. I think just when I just started school, uh, my one of my cousins found it and sent it to me a, a couple of months back, so I can definitely share that. Fantastic. With you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting it on the blog. Okay, so you so you you went uh, so you came over to the UK at that time in the eighties. Yes, that's right. Um, and then I mean, if we fast, and then I went to school there. Then I went to university, moved to London, got married, um, and then I actually got a job in in Vienna with the UN in back in two thousand and two, and that's when we when we moved to, we moved to mm -hmm. Vienna. And in terms of coffee, what actually happened um, in two thousand and five? We actually went to. Italy on holiday and we sit in an apartment and my my cousin's married to an Italian and he said oh try a mocha pot I was like what is a mocha pot so I tried it and I thought oh wow coffee tastes different from what I was used to back then I was just really fascinated by it um and it wasn't anything special it was just a different taste bud and when I was much younger I actually loved food so you know kids would always talk about it in class oh my favorite sport is football and I was like well my favorite sport is like eating Everybody look at me and think, yeah. is, is this guy okay? So definitely back before I was in 10, I really liked culinary things. So just fast forward to 2005, I thought, oh, coffee can taste this different. I just did a lot of research and I bought some coffee books. And then I think in 2007 in England, they actually launched something called Cafe Culture. It was like the first coffee exhibition. So I actually, you know, saved some money and actually went to that event. And I met like World Barrister Champion. James Hoffman, who was actually going to be the champion the next year. 
I just was fascinated by something completely different and, you know, a whole conference on coffee. And I just spent like, two days just asking lots of questions, got really fascinated by that. And I said, you know what, I want to have a coffee shop. But if I'm going to be, if I'm going to have a coffee shop, I'm the kind of person that I want to be a guru in it. What, it is, what is it about espresso? What is this thing called the God Shot? So then I stumbled onto something called Coffee Geek, which is one of the most famous um, coffee websites. I just started learning so much about it. And then I thought, okay, I'm not ready to have my coffee shop. So what should I do? I thought, okay, let me share this knowledge. So I said, okay, let me create a website. So after po um, pontificating a lot for a while, I, might, I love James Bond from, from Russia with Love. I thought, oh, let me try from Coffee with Love because it's like a bit of a love thing. And, and the website was available. I thought, that's, ex that's me, basically. So that's from Coffee with Love. So that's how the name came about. Um, so Fantastic. That, yeah. <laughs> um, so just moving on forward in terms of, um, so basically in 2009, um, my job at the UN actually finished. And I actually, I have to confess, I actually, I did apply for, for lots of jobs and not, nothing came through. I thought to myself, you know, what? I'm not going to sit around waiting for someone to give me a job. Let me just follow my passion and open up a coffee shop. Of course, everybody thought, oh, you're crazy. And then I, my wife and thought I was even more crazy. And I said, you know, let's do it in Cape Town. Cape Town? <laughs> it's like, why Cape Town? I said, well, it's just a different part of the world. And I used to, I used to transit a lot there because in my, last, my job there, I was covering countries in Africa. So I, always, I covered Southern Africa. So I always had to connect through South Africa to come back to Europe. I always just spent like a couple of days in, in, in Cape Town. I thought this is a really nice place. Um, let's try it. So after a while, we put the plan through. We moved to Cape Town just at the end of 2009 and then look for a spot. Um, got my cafe. I designed most of it with, a, with, a, with an architect. I thought this is my, this is my dream. So let me do what I, let me go full on basically. So design the furniture, design the layout. Um, and then we opened that thing in September, 2010. And then we started basically rolling out. And of course, it was very, very difficult. Um, at the beginning, it was a bit of a big buzz, but then it kind of dies down. And I think one of the challenges with my first lessons is that, you know, I went with a bit of like a, what I call a European mentality. It's like, okay, if it's high quality, everybody's going to come, they're going to taste it and say, wow, I tell everybody about, the, about this cafe. But it doesn't work like that. Cape Town, I'm not, and I'm not taking anything away from them, they're very clicky. So I'll have people who will come to my cafe and say, yeah, this is, this is a really good coffee. But the next day, they wouldn't come and I thought, why not? Because they had friends they grew up with who had cafes. The cafes could have been serving bad coffee, but it was still good out of loyalty to their friends. And I was basically a newbie. I was in Cape Town by myself, just moving with my family and my two kids. Didn't know anybody. So it's like, they don't owe me anything. So why would they come? Okay, great coffee, but okay, so what? Whereas I, my, my impression was like, you know, when I used to go to London a lot, I started studying my book, right. was it, um, I saw a lot of, People went, um, especially specialty coffee back then, like, you know, Flat White was um, one of the Fernandes and Wells in Soho. And a lot of people would go and queue to get to those coffee shops because it was very new to have things called Flat White Cappuccino, third wave coffee. And I thought, okay, yeah, that, that would work. The great quality, great customers, but that was not the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you know, it's like, um, and we'll be coming on to this, and I guess uh, a little bit later on, but... Um, coffee is, is for, for some of us, coffee is the, is the thing, you know, it's the reason, yeah. but for others, coffee is just the medium for a social, a social interaction yeah. and, uh, and the social interaction becomes the more important element because coffee isn't their thing, which is, which is fine. Right. So it more becomes around, uh, social factors than it does around the quality of the product. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, this, and I'm going to continue with my story in Cape Town. So what happened is after about a few, few months, um, obviously the promise of, you know, this fantastic coffee, I've got all the best machines like La Marzocco and all that kind of stuff. I basically, I replicated what I saw in the London cafe. So all the top stuff, uh, I have so many good trained barristers. And then, um, in 2005, actually, when I worked for the International Atomic Energy Agency, we actually were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And everybody got an award. And my wife said to me, why don't you just tell people you have a Nobel Peace Prize so they can come? And I was like, oh, I don't want to tell people I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That's nothing to do. I just want them to have great coffee. It's not about me. It's about the coffee. And after a while, she said, no, just put, a, put something about it. So what I did is I, I found that there was a unique gifts about my, my staff. 
So one of my barristers actually, he almost played professional football in England. But on the day he was about to go off, he was in a match and he actually broke his legs. So that was the end of his career. So what I did is I just put down something in a cafe, like, you know, say, did you know that one of us won a Nobel Peace Prize? Did you know that one of us almost played professional football in England? And do you know one of us has been working in coffee for five years, so a speciality. And then someone will come in and say, what's that? Who, who won a Nobel Peace Prize? That's, why are you guys lying? And then my wife said, you know what? Frame your award and put it in the cafe. That will shut them up. <laughs> so lesson one, <laughs> Always listen to your wife. <laughs> so I did that. And then, of course, that's said to, to create a buzz. People are like, oh, have you heard about this cafe, Escape Cafe? The, the owner actually wanted to just, oh, no, get out of here. Okay. Then that created a bit of a buzz. And then the, the second buzz was basically, um, I took about, I love baking. So I took about seven years to develop a cheesecake recipe. And my wife loved cheesecake. So I always would test our cheesecake recipe. She said, oh, this is the, I think about 2008, because this is the recipe. Don't change it again. This is the best recipe. So I said, okay, fine. So what I did, Twitter was quite new back then. And I just started contacting food writers. So I kind of one food writer. I said, oh, can you come to my cafe? Test my cheesecake. It's really nice. So she came one day and she's, she actually had my cheesecake. Because, wow, this cheesecake is the best cheesecake she's had in Cape Town. And from a food writer, I was like, I said, really? She said, yeah. So the first thing, put your price up because your price is too low. So, you know, increase it by 30, 40%. So I did that and she said, and she, she had access to the most famous newspaper, like it was an Afrikaans paper. So I'm going to do a double spread on you. So the next day she came with a, you know, a photographer and she put that in the paper. And after that, I had, people were calling me saying, I'm going for your cheesecake. They would drive 45 minutes away. Um, and then we broke, so we broke even in about 11 months. So just from, you know, reaching out, well, obviously listen to my wife about Nobel Peace Prize. And then she put in the article, of course, and people were fascinated by that. And then the cheesecake and everybody started coming. And so that that's basically how we we, we broke even. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, and then we, of course, and then we, we... <laughs> Do you know that the cheesecake is a common theme? I, I... Yeah, carry, carry on, carry on. No, I was going to say that um, at my cafe, we had this peanut butter cheesecake. Oh, and wow. what we're going to do, Lamine, is we no i'm telling you people I, you go on TripAdvisor, and everybody talks about our cheesecake i had a guy that would fly in from russia wow. uh, for business meetings but whenever he was there he used to buy whole cheesecakes as many as he could get into his bag and he would take them back he'd come in early in the morning before the flight is it my cheesecake ready he'd be like yeah we'd get his cheesecakes out and you know he'd, he'd fly it back to russia so uh and it's peanut butter which goes really great with coffee because the fat and the butter yeah. yeah, and the acidity from the coffee is just perfect together. So oh, what wow. we're going to do, Lamine, is we're going to – no one knows the recipe. No one knows the recipe except for, obviously, you know, us. <laughs> and and uh, people have begged me. People have offered to pay me. I've not given it to anybody. I'm going to send you under strict contracts. We're going to have lawyers draw up contracts. <laughs> and <laughs> – I'm going to send you my peanut butter cheesecake recipe and some pictures. You'll see how good it looks. Okay. You're going to tell me your, your cheesecake recipe, which I will not disclose to anybody. Is that fair? I mean, that's from, this is, maybe it's another lesson. I mean, I've actually disclosed my cheesecake recipe before, but I mean, as a baker, you probably know that I can give you a recipe, but it doesn't mean that it's going to come out yes. the same way. I think that's like, just, it's like in life, everybody can, you, maybe everybody can study maths at the same time, maybe get great A's in them, but it doesn't mean that everybody is going to work for, I don't know, NASA or whatever. It's, 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 I think it's how you take the ingredients of life and how you basically make it into something. Everybody has a unique quality. So I actually said my cheesecake recipe with some people. You're so right. It, ne it doesn't come out like yours. I said, well, that's the recipe and I've told you what you should do that I can't, there's nothing else I can do. I don't know whether it's your <laughs> oven or and I feel sometimes there was a bit of energy. I remember once I shared my cheesecake, maybe I'm on a tangent a little bit. So one of my staff was a bit, he was, he was always trying to compete with me in my, in my cafe. And my other famous thing in the cafe was actually the carrot cake. So that always used to sell out. I called it a lumber carrot cake. And once he made the recipe and he said, oh yeah, my carrot cake is just as good as yours. And I said, you're not making carrot cake anyway. He goes, why not? I said, that's not the point. I don't want you to bring any kind of, I don't know what it is, what, bad vibes into it's not a competition 
And he tried it once with my cheesecake and it was completely, you know, every, my wife said, please don't sell that. You're going to embarrass my husband. He said, well, it's the same recipe. He said, no, it doesn't taste anything like my, my, like my husband's. I said, it's not about the recipe, but maybe transform some kind of energy or I'm not sure what it is. I, it's maybe one of the secrets of life, but I just, it's one of the things I realized in cooking and baking. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. Um, it is very much, it is the recipes are all on the internet. Although I haven't seen this recipe on the internet, but the recipes generally, you can get loads of recipes, right? Yeah. But it is very much how you make it. And, uh, and, um, and, and as you say, maybe there's a little extra ingredient that goes into there, uh, which, and I always to tell people, look, you'll never make it because even if I told you the ingredients and they said, why? And they said, because I ha you have to make it with love. And they'd be like, I can do love. Said, you can't do love like I can do love. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you actually touched on one of the things that it's, I, I, was, I was actually hesitant to say that, but I think it's due with that kind of love. And it's, more, it's not just, just putting things together and hoping for the best. It, there's some, some kind of other energy that comes, I think some kind of spiritual energy that comes into it as well. <laughs> Right. That, that probably leads on to what you wanted to talk about anyway. <laughs> it does. And I've just realized my lights are off and, I, and I'm standing in the dark. It feels all right here. But let me go and just pull my blinds up. Oh, one second. I don't know. But maybe this will, this will help a little bit. Can you see me better now? Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's much better. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for mentioning that earlier. Jesus. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to swiftly, uh, and, and very awkwardly, uh, 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 segue into a little bit on philosophy because you and I talked about it. We talked about philosophy a little bit, actually quite a bit. And, um, you know, the coffee industry is an interesting place yeah. uh, in some respects. I'm sure it's like every other industry, but, but it has, What's kind of unique, I suppose, from my perspective, what's kind of unique as I look into this is there's this value chain mm -hmm. that goes all the way from sort of the very much engaged with the earth, people who are working the earth and who are relatively poor, um, most of them, uh, all the way through to a value chain at the end where yuppies like me go drive down in our, you know, in our, in our BMWs and, and buy a, a flat white to go. And so, and, and there's a lot of talk in the industry about how do we, we create better lives for, for those people in the value chain that don't, um, that don't get as much out of it. Maybe don't get a fair wage, yeah. maybe don't even get a living wage. Um, and, and a lot of talk about the mechanics right? Yeah. And I've got a particular point of view. This is why I want to bring the philosophy into it. So, and there, there, and this applies in two, in two places. So the first place it applies is that uh, companies aren't evil, right? Companies aren't evil. Companies aren't anything. Companies are made up of people. And so whenever, whatever solution that you have, or you want to put into place, uh, it has to involve understanding people, what motivates people, what yeah. kind of people they are. And if you want to make a change, an effective change, then you have to affect the change in the people. It's not yeah. about organizations making rules or policies or having some policy. Yeah. Um, it's about actually understanding what's driving the people behind that company or potentially the people who are the shareholders of that company. Yeah. Or in some cases, the people who are the customers of that company, because that will by necessity drive that, that company yes. uh, to change. So th this is and this is effectively philosophy. The second area of philosophy, which is which is interesting to talk about, is that of entrepreneurship and a particular passion of mine. And I say passion because that's contrary to a stoic kind of belief that I hold, but which is about being passionless, interestingly enough. But it's it's a real interest of mine. Um, is is entrepreneurs? I love entrepreneurs. They're the most interesting people. People are the most interesting things, and the people who get up every morning and create, you know, their day, mm -hmm. who create their future, are people that I find uh, fascinating to talk to. Yeah. So, I wanted to I wanted to just talk to you briefly about um, the relationship that you see between coffee. And purpose. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I, I mean, I touched a little bit briefly on it earlier on um, when I talked about moving to Cape Town. It wasn't just, I said, okay, I love coffee, I want to move. Obviously, I do some kind of connection. And it, it goes back even to the word from coffee with love. Because when I started building this relationship, it felt like, um, I don't know if I can say this, or my wife's going to watch this. It, it was like a kind of, a, a, it was like sort of being drawn by something very fascinating um, because you're discovering more about yourself, basically. It's just, okay, I never knew coffee could taste like this. My taste buds are doing this. I'm discovering more about myself. What's motivating me to do this? And earlier on, I remember when I, went, when I was going to go to, to Cape Town to open up my cafe, one of my former colleagues said to me, well, you're, it's still like you're in the UN because you wanted to be in the UN because you wanted to help people have a better life. And now you're just going to be, you're still going to be serving people because you want to serve them something that you're passionate about, something that you love. You want to transfer that love and give that kind of service to them. So I think in terms of purpose, that, and that's how I see it. I mean, we think about the original word of passion, which actually relates to the passion of Christ. It's, it's kind of suffering. So basically there's something that you really crave and you're prepared to suffer for it to get to where you want to, <laughs> where you want to get to. And it's kind of mm -hmm. a motivating force. And I think that is centralized also in your heart. And it's kind of intertwined with the coffee. So I remember saying, mentioning to someone on Twitter, I'm sorry, on LinkedIn, and I said, oh, I'm trying to understand my relation between coffee and my purpose. And he goes, what's there to understand? If you're passionate about something, that means that you feel that you're going to thrive in that particular area in terms of your purpose. So that's how I see the kind of relationship. It's not just about saying coffee. It's like, okay, say, I, I feel that there's something in part of me that I want to give. Um, it's like I want to show up. I want to show up in the world to say, this is my special skill that I love, and I want to share that with you. It's not about sitting at home making fantastic coffee, pouring latte. It's like, okay, that's nice. I enjoy that every morning. But if I feel like this, there must be other people in the world that feels like that feel like this. Um, and you know, I, yeah. I, I, and you know, when you run your cafe, yes, I had a fantastic coffee shop, but the experiences that I had with the customers, no, no, no day was the same. It's just, it's, it's just fascinating. You're growing, you're learning from different people. I mean, I have so many fantastic stories when I, in my cafe, even when I was not making any money, just people will come and share with me their stories about what they've done and why they came to my cafe. I don't, even, I don't know if we have enough time, but um, one, one of the stories that really touches me was, there was um, the history of cheesecake is actually, it's actually a Jewish tradition. And there was, there's quite a, there was quite a few Jews in um, Cape Town. And one of the stories that really hit me was, uh, this 90 year old man came to my cafe and apparently someone has said this had the best cheesecake. And he said he actually wanted to taste it because he's been having cheesecake all his life. So he came one day, it was very quiet. It was a, it's a, actually one of our busiest periods ever. And I saw this guy in the corner, I said, oh, would you like some your cheesecake? I've heard about it. So I spoke to him, gave him a slice of the cheesecake. And afterwards he came to me and he said, you know what? I think I'm gonna bring my wife here to taste this cheesecake because this is one of the best cheesecake. And this is a 90 year old man has been cheesecake all his life. Yeah. And for me, that, I was like, wow. I mean, even if I didn't make it, what is like, that story was enough. And then he came back with his wife's true enough. And said, oh yeah, we just want to taste it. I want my wife to take, have the same experience that I had when I came to your cafe. And, that, and for me, it's like, you know, purpose has to be like, what you're looking to impact on people's lives. For me, that, that was fantastic. I mean, that, I, I can't put a price on that. For someone to, uh, for someone to, yeah, for, for me to communicate that love that I had to share my purpose with with someone like that. So I mean, we can go a little bit more into. Coffee. It's a very, yeah. it's a very personal and it's a very micro thing, right? So it's a micro thing, yeah. and I think this is one of the areas that a lot of people, when they're young, I know certainly it was my uh, misconception, yeah. is that as a as a as a young person wanting to be an entrepreneur, I uh, I, I I I dreamed of changing the world. Yeah. And it's such a naive statement to make. Um, what I dream about now is, is, you know, changing one person's life. Mm -hmm. If I can Im positively impact one person's life, then I've, I've done, I've done something amazing. I've done something okay. great. Definitely. And then maybe, you know, that person goes and change, changes another person's life in a positive way. Yeah. And if I can change two people's lives, you know, if I can have a positive impact on two people, you know, then that's, and that's an amazing thing too. Definitely. And so, so from a, so interesting what you talked about, 
uh, just now is is forms part of I, I have a philosophy. I don't know what philosophy it is. <laughs> it's a philosophy <laughs> like kind of jumbled together by reading different books. Because most of us, most of us, and I think this is part of the problem that that people see philosophy as something that that scholars do. And actually, if you go back to the Greek times, it was uh, and the Roman times, philosophy was 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 important because you needed a, a code to live your life by. You needed it was practical. Philosophy was a very practical science. It's it gave you it, it gave you the way that you would lead your life. Yes. Um, but uh, Right. Um, and 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 so that pretty enough stoicism came from that part. So the two main parts of my philosophy are stoicism and existentialism and um, specifically <laughs> phenomenological existentialism, which is a horrible word because it makes it sound like it's like Jesus, you know, OK, I don't want to learn that, you know, all these fancy words and whatever. But actually, it's 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 fascinating because what you just said was existentialism what you just talked about was effectively existentialism which was that these interactions def helped define your you know your joy in in the world and so an existentialist will will um if, if you so the foundation where it came from was the understanding and this is going back to i guess we're talking about the 1930s and we're going into world war ii yeah and you've got a group of French philosophers, Sartre and, and, and uh, his girlfriend, um, uh, Simone de Beauvoir. If I ever come back reborn as a woman, I want to be called Simone de Beauvoir. What a name, you know? <laughs> Simone de Beauvoir. It doesn't get, for me, that's the pinnacle. It doesn't get any better than that. Uh, it's so classy. It's a lot better than Nick, you know? Nick, Simone de Beauvoir. So, um, so these 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 these. These philosophers were, were uh, you know, going through this, this crazy time, needed to, to have an explanation for, for, their, for their lives. And all the, uh, unfortunately, philosophy for a long time had lost its way, right? And it, was, and it had become the realm of, of uh, academics. And there was no longer a, a, a true mapping, a, a, a true blueprint for, for, for life. And through a bunch of work that we're not going to talk about today, they basically came to this conclusion, which was that um, humans are the only animals that can decide their own future. And that other animals, we take a look at a cat, a cat is defined by its nature. Yeah. It is a cat. You can talk to it. You can try to educate it. You can try to change its behavior, but it's going to always be true to its nature. Yeah. It's a cat. It's going to do cat things. And it's the same for every animal, but people from moment to moment, we can, we can choose. Yes. We have the freedom. So this was actually tied into the concept of freedom. We have the freedom to choose what we want to do, mm -hmm. but with that freedom comes a huge burden yeah. because when we choose what we want to do, we have to take responsibility yeah. and the taking the responsibility for our actions and our choices is where I'm tying this back to the whole coffee thing. Yeah. And the coffee industry and the inequalities is because there's not enough people that understand that. And we have a blame culture. We have, uh, I see a lot of malaise in, in the world. And, and this is true in the coffee industry as well, yeah. uh, where, where uh, um, people don't understand what, uh, what's truly important in their life. They're generally unhappy. A lot of people are genuinely unhappy. And they're unhappy because they're trying to achieve things like org like people in big organizations are trying to achieve, uh, achieve things. Um, and their achievements are these big goals and these big objectives yeah. or these meaningless objectives like share price and et cetera, et cetera, yeah. which kind of sound important. You can wrap it all up in all this complexity, but it's actually not the, it's not the point. And actually, if you read books like um, like the, the philosopher Osho, who's a slightly controversial character, but nevertheless a very intelligent one, he he reveals, and, and to me it was, it was a revelation, that actually it's the little things. If you want happiness, it's the little things. And he talks about the um, the happiness that can come from making a cup of tea or coffee. Yes. Right? And... <laughs> 
And I do this every morning. When I realized this, when I learned this, this was an epiphany to me, Lamine, because I realized that every interaction I have with something, I can derive pleasure from. I can derive pleasure from having a conversation. I'm enjoying this conversation with you right now. Good. It's not... <laughs> It's not an objective. It's not some huge, you know, of, you know, I, I, you know, lifelong dream that I'm trying to pursue. I'm just enjoying talking to you and I'm enjoying my coffee. I enjoy making my coffee. And so philosophy and drinking for me, the whole purpose of drinking coffee is, uh, is, is oftentimes to have it with a friend, right? Mm-hmm. So we sit down with friends, we have a coffee, the coffee is an excuse and a medium to get us together. I go around to my dad's house. He's got this ancient bean with a lever. He goes through a ritual of making the coffee. We talk about the beans that he gets. I, I, I grimace at the technique that he uses to make the coffee, but I say nothing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and so anyway, so, so, uh, so that, that part of it is important but critical if you're going to get into business yeah. and if you're going to do, if you're going to open a coffee shop and you're going to do any kind of business, y- you need to have a philosophy behind you because if you don't have a foundation, a strong foundation of beliefs yeah. and understanding, then every, every time something goes wrong, every time there's a problem, every time uh, things don't go to plan, you're going to not understand why you're going to get depressed and you're going to uh, ultimately throw in the towel yes. and, and, and then get, and then get bitter and, and, and blame other people. And, and this becomes a real problem. So the truly successful entrepreneurs, I believe whether they know it or not are following a philosophy. Yeah. What do you think about that? Um, I think that, I mean, that's a really good point. I was just thinking about my experience when I had my cafe and uh, I mentioned to you that we broke even in 11 months. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't make enough money to pay myself or to educate my kids. That came from savings. <laughs> and then sometimes, you know, after, after that ended, people say, oh, um, oh, so it wasn't successful. And I said, actually, no, it was, it was successful. What, the, well, how do you define success? Oh, I didn't go there. I didn't open up a cafe in Cape Town to be a millionaire. That was not my purpose. <laughs> it was just for the experience of it. I mean, we talk about other experiences, the experience of, of having my kids grow up in a different part of the world, they appreciate a different part of the world. You can't put a price on that. And I always say that, you know, about, about four years after I closed my cafe, I had this special feeling. I don't know, I still can't describe it. So like, you know, I was back in a corporate environment and people were complaining about, oh, Monday, oh, I can't afford to Friday. I just couldn't, I couldn't relate to them because maybe that, that thing about finding your purpose, I, I've gained something I never thought about. It, I had this kind of glow within myself. I, I still don't know if everybody experiences this. And it goes back to how to define, how to define success. I think success, you know, a lot of people try and measure success. And I actually wrote about something on LinkedIn and Instagram last week about it. I, I was surprised a lot of people were saying, wow, this is really interesting. I said, I think success is something that's intrinsic. And, if, and I don't think it can really be measured what do I mean by that? I mean that if, for example, you say, let's use the cafe. I want to, I want to share my love of coffee with people. So I sold up a cafe and, and so on. Like I give you the example of the 90 year old um, Jewish guy that brought his wife, that experience for me, that's like success. It's only one customer, but the, but the feeling that I get, or people saying, Oh, wow, this is really great coffee. Or I converted some of my customers who were, who were tea drinkers into coffee. And some of them who always just drink coffee with sugar and stop drinking, stop, stop taking sugar because they just listen to me and I prevent coffee in a particular way for them. For me, that's, that's success. Success is not because I've made millions or whatever. That's not, it's, it's that kind of, it's like an internal mechanism when your heart, where you feel like, ah, oh, yeah, this is, I, I like this feeling. And it's not something you can say it's, it's, it's from outside or I've got, I've got the car now, I've got the two cars, I've got the house or I've got the kids, I've got the grandkids. And I've seen them. Those are, those, are all, those are all important, don't get me wrong. But I, I think that real success cannot be measured. I think that's how, in terms of your philosophy in life, as you said, I think it's really important you said that entrepreneurs have some kind of philosophy. If not, they don't, then when things go wrong, they're not going to know why they're doing it because they've based it on something else. And life isn't like that. I'm not sure if that answers your, your question. <laughs> yeah. 
It, well, it does. You know, you, you know, you, we're totally on the same wavelength. I had, I've, I've started a number of businesses. I've done a number of businesses. I'd say, I don't know, something a little bit more than 50% have succeeded, but that means there are a lot of failures, right? And my early fit, my, remember my first terrible failure. Um, and I almost certainly took years off my life. I got ill. I worked myself till I was physically ill. I was having horrible nightmares every night. Uh, I, I, because I had no mental tools for dealing with it. And I was taking everything hugely personally. I was taking so much responsibility for things. And I was blaming people, uh, for things that were out of my control. And, um, and so the ultimate, when, when I closed that business and walked away, it was a huge relief for me, but I never wanted to go back and do that again. And then I realized well, what am I? I can't go and get a job. Who's going to hire me, right? I, I've I've always worked for myself. Uh, I'm going to have to start another business, but I don't ever want to go through that horrible experience again. So, how do I reconcile that? Yeah. How do I, as an entrepreneur, do another business but not but not do that? Well, I can run a business that never fails. Okay, start a <laughs> business that never fails. That sounds like a great idea, right? <laughs> Everybody would do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we all want to do that. But but the reality is, no, you have to change your relationship with 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 failure. I don't even call it failure. Like everyone says this, and it's a term that we all know, but a lot of us don't believe. We kind of know it theoretically. Oh, yes, no, you never fail. You just keep trying till you succeed or you just uh, – the truth of the matter is, no, you don't ever fail. The people who fail are the people that never start. They fail themselves, right? Wow. And they, they don't start because they, they have so much fear. And fear being outside our comfort zone, yeah. that's totally normal. It's totally natural. So the, the, the only way that we can overcome that, and by the way, if you don't go outside your comfort zone, you're always in your comfort zone. And if you're always in your comfort zone, you're never growing. And if you're never growing, you're never happy. This yeah. is a fact. This has been proven over and over again. Yeah. People who, who never grow, who never change are not happy. You have to be feeling like you as an individual, spiritually, physically, whatever it is, mentally, that you're growing. And if you're always staying in your comfort zone, you're not growing. So you have to push yourself outside. Yeah. But then what happens if you push yourself outside and you get your fingers burned and you have no mental way to, to, to process that? Yeah, exactly. What's the mental way to process that? And, and that is having a philosophy. And so it's worth reading, even though, unfortunately, a lot of the texts, a lot of the past texts are, you know, I wouldn't recommend starting with Marcus Aurelius <laughs> meditation because <laughs> um, it's kind of a little bit heavy. But, uh, but there's lots of books out there now that actually, and, and audio books and everything else that give you a great sort of basic overview and introductions and make it much more approachable. Yeah. And if you can start to get a, and even actually there's one call I read a, oh, years ago called, I think it's called the chimpanzee paradox. I saw the chimp paradox, something like that, which is psych, which is, which is philosophy and psychology hidden in a management book. So you don't oh, even wow. know that you're reading philosophy and <laughs> Yeah. And they don't say that, but that's the truth of it. But it gives you the tools. So I'd recommend to anybody out there who's who's in the coffee business or whatever, it doesn't matter what business, the bean to bar business, and you're thinking of starting, but you're worried about, you know, what are people going to say if I fail? Mm -hmm. um, what uh, What's going to happen to me if I fail? Can I afford to do it? Can I, you know, et cetera. If you're asking all those normal kinds of questions, first, number one, understand they're normal to ask yeah. right number two to understand that we've all been there right yeah. so you're not alone this isn't you're not you know the only person out there in the world who's, who's gone through this and number three that actually you can equip yourself with the mental tools to deal with it mm -hmm. and I, I don't know now i'm relatively fearless i don't care yeah. you might notice it's from my website <laughs> where we we talk very openly and honestly about things and and i and it's such a better way of dealing with things um, I have a guy, a friend of mine, a business partner who, when I do something bad or wrong, I mean, he comes and he tells me in the most horribly brutal terms and he's not nasty about it, but I'm going to paraphrase something he said about some design work that I did. I'd worked a month and I'm not a designer. I'd done, I'd done some like, thing, I'm going to do this design thing. And I, I quite liked the idea of it. And I worked on it for about a month and I showed it to him and he looked at it and he went, Oh, 
Oh God, that's the ugliest thing I think I've ever seen. Siri can't put that up. That's oh my God, that's ugly. <laughs> I was hurt. That I was hurt. I said, but 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 you know, but you know, look look at the the, the thing and isn't that? And he's like, no, Nick, you're not putting that up. That's so that's so damned ugly. Burn that. Seriously, take that out right now and just burn it. And I love him. I love him for, for saying that because he was so right. A month later, I'm looking back and I'm like, yeah, you know, actually it was terrible. I'm, I'm not good at this. I shouldn't do it. But what if he had, what if he lied to me? I've got this coffee roaster. I mean, it's my last story. This is not about me. This coffee roaster, he sent me some beans to review. You know, we do a podcast each week and we review beans. Yeah. And this guy's really nice. And, um, and he contacted me and he said, would you review? I've seen you. I've heard your podcast. Would you review our beans? Now, we, I ended up getting into a conversation with him and he's been really, really nice. And he's, and I've looked at his stuff and I see they're doing a lot of great ethical work and all the rest of it. And it crossed my mind that now I've built a bit of a relationship with this guy. What if I don't like his beans? Do you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> Compromised. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to tell him. I, I'm going to say on the podcast, I don't like these beans. I won't be doing him any favors because I won't be doing him any favors by by lying. Yeah. The thing is that I know that he's a that that he's a kind of um, he's mature enough that uh, as an individual yeah. that uh, that if I don't like his beans as, as a personal preference, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. Maybe if I don't like them, that that's okay. And, and he actually wrote to me, he said, he said, I've got faith in the beans. I laughed. I said, you're bring brave. You know that, right? You've heard some of our reviews. And he said, have faith in the beans. I have faith in the beans. Bless him. Um, but, but, uh, but he will survive. And not only will he survive if I give him a bad review. I haven't tasted them yet, so I don't know. But he will thrive because he will take the feedback. If yeah. it's negative feedback, he will take it and he'll work the positive from it. So exactly. he'll say, why, are these, why didn't he like these beans? He'll go back to his provider, maybe, or his supplier, or where he gets the beans from. Or maybe he won't. Maybe he'll just say they went for Nick. But it'll give him an opportunity to have an honest opinion. And yeah. there is, you know, and so the, having a right philosophy, some people, if you give neg negative feedback, they crumble. Yeah. Right? Don't they? And you need yeah. to have that, again, have that philosophy in life to, to understand when something doesn't go your way, when someone tells you that you're a jerk, yeah. that you can deal with it. Yeah. And that, that relates to that. I'm sure you've heard of this book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. So she, it's really, no, I don't know it. It's, a, well, it's basically the concept of people basically have two things, a fixed mindset or growth mindset. So a fixed mindset is people who, have, who rely on their talents or their skills. And growth mindset are people like you just described. So if you tell them something's wrong, they'll say, okay, what was wrong? How can I grow? How can I learn from this? So you basically have two kind of mentalities in, in the world. Um, if you take like a good sportsman, let's say like someone like Ronaldo, he will say, oh, Ronaldo, he's fantastic. He's got a lot of skill, but they don't forget that he's, he trains more than everybody else. He's not, he's not, he doesn't say, oh, because I can dribble, I'm, I'm brilliant. It's because he trains. I remember even with Be David Beckham, you read his story. Um, when he was younger, they, they used to finish training around 7 p.m. And you know, you know what, what it's like in England in the winter? He would stay for an extra two to three hours every night yeah. practicing free kicks. They don't see that part. They just say, oh, Beckham's a great footballer. They don't see the hard work. So basically the growth mindset is people who learn from their mistakes and fixed mindset are people who say, oh, why, is the, why, is, why did this happen to me? Oh, it's that person's fault. Well, I had a bad day because, you know, um, I, hit, I hit my foot. That's why I didn't do well in that exam. So that's the kind of, kind of thing. But just, just a couple of things before um, we go off. Um, we were talking a little bit about coffee and philosophy and um, you talked about um, how people want to learn from their experience. And I'm actually in the process of actually developing yeah. uh, an, an on, two online courses. So the first online course relates to what you said, and I was going to develop a course on how to open up a coffee based business. And in fact, chapter one is exactly what you said about mindset. So my, my chapter one ends with a challenge it says, if you don't believe and you don't have the right mindset, talking about a coffee shop or business, then mm -hmm. just drop it now. Just don't go on to chapter two and I'll give you your money back. <laughs> because yeah, definitely. It's all about, if you don't have a philosophy or mindset for it, it's just not going to work. So that's, that's actually how I ended my chapter one in, in, in my, in, in, I've done the outline. I'll share that with you as I promised. And then I think the second thing we talked about 
um, was about Fantastic. relating about different types of coffee to to philosophy. And I talked about espresso, for example. Espresso is roughly 25 seconds. And um, I, I was trying to relate that to how you find your purpose, how you tr tr try and tackle an immediate goal. For example, the Italians are noted for drinking about 20 or 30 cups of espresso every day. And people say, how can they take so much caffeine? But espresso has the least amount of caffeine. A lot of people don't know that. But it just takes small shots. And it's the idea of your life, how you... Do you want to tackle things on a daily basis? Do you have little problems you want to deal with? Or you've got something like a French press, which is basically a longer brewing process. I remember when you talked to me, and just going back to the story you mentioned about your dad, about his process of making coffee. You said he wanted to make filter coffee. And people sometimes say they don't have the time, but you said, actually, no, let's turn it upside down. How about, not give, how about giving more time to invest in things that you actually enjoy and get the benefit from it because that's one of the first factors about entrepreneurship people think oh it's a quick, get rich quick fix there's no such thing like that in life all the entrepreneurs that we've read about whether it's jeff bezos or steve, steve jobs they all went it's, it was not you know like that it's a, it's a process and most things in life they just take time to develop it wasn't about the money to those people exactly. funnily enough you know, it wasn't about the money. It, it was about the challenge. It was about doing something they felt strongly about. Um, and, and it was fulfilling some kind of inner drive yeah. for them. And yeah, thank you for bringing that up about the taking your time part. Because um, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, I get up early in the morning. I take my time making my coffee. Enjoy. Every, every time I still smell the beans before I put them in the hopper. Every time, you know, I, 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 I have a very sort of tactile interactive. I smell the coffee. I stir it. I slurp it. I, you know, it takes, it takes, it takes a while. I'm drinking a pour over at the moment and I like pour overs. Uh, I prefer espresso as a drink. But I like the process of making a pour over because the meditative kind of yeah. circles that I make, it's sort of very Buddhist in, in, in that respect, the, yeah. the sort of the repetition and the watching the bloom happen and yeah. doing all of that early in the morning with my phone on silent. So, and, and people are told not to call me before 930, but I still put my phone on silent. So I have no interruptions. I don't listen to audio books, uh, which I do rest of the day, but I don't listen to it in the morning. Uh, I will just have silence yeah. and I'll be there with my thoughts and um, and first thing in the morning, you've got uh, the prefrontal cortex part of the brain, which is the the imaginative problem solving kind of part of the brain. That's replenished with glucose. So that that's the, one of the best times to be thinking. Yeah. So as an entrepreneur, uh, as a business person, um, you want to be knowing the the physiological changes in your body, mm -hmm. and when to apply yourself to different tasks. To make the best time out of out of uh, out of those moments when you're best suited to to do that particular task. Yeah. So thinking when you're tired is not the best time to be thinking. No. <laughs> you know. But when I'm making my coffee and I'm doing that meditative thing, um, then it's a great time to be thinking because you're doing something that 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 slightly takes your your mind part of your mind. That, that otherwise blocks your thoughts into doing something that, that, that uses the basal ganglia part of the brain, the sort of the repetitive yeah. motion, the muscle memory, as it's called. And then your prefrontal cortex is freed up and suddenly starts to remember things like, ah, oh, crap, it's my mom's birthday. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, or suddenly that idea that for, for doing something different that, you know, that you wouldn't have thought of if you, if you were listening to music whilst doing things. So, yeah. yeah, very much. There's, there's a, there's a healthy, there's a, there's a natural process to this and it's yeah. healthy. Um, and, uh, and, 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 um, I think uh, too many people fill up their days with stuff mm -hmm. and they don't give enough time to, to just be a human. I think we, I mean, I think when we mentioned that there was the, the Japanese concept of Ikigai. So basically it's a Japanese philosophy of life. And one of the first things that we talked about when talking about coffee was actually to the joy in small things, finding something in your day. I mean, the, the, the book is really, uh, I have a really good book on that. And it talked about in the sushi chefs, how they spend hours just enjoying that. Also the Japanese tea center, which is also famous. I mean, now because we're on a coffee podcast, just taking your time, 
and enjoying that process first thing in the morning is so key to how your day will go and just thinking about what you're doing. I think you explained it much better than I, I did, but I just want to say that it's also related to the concept of Ikigai as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Hey, Lamine, listen, I said I'd take up 45 minutes of your time and I've been talking to you for an hour. Okay. And it's always the way it goes. I'm talking to someone interesting and it's <laughs> so much fun. The one thing I want to say, and I'm going to end on this because yeah. then you won't get a chance to talk back is the real reason you should have won the Nobel prize is talking your wife into leaving to go to, to, to go to a different country to start a coffee shop. That to me, you should write a book on how you did that because <laughs> that should have got you the Nobel prize, my friend. <laughs> Yeah, I have, to, I have to think about that because I'm, I'm already planning my next adventure. So, um, so yes, that's that's one of those things. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> she would she would like that. <laughs> <laughs> i'd love to meet your wife sometime so uh listen if i come to austria i don't know if you ever come to the uk if i come to austria uh i, I would love to 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 swing by um and and meet you uh, in person but it's been a real great pleasure to talk to you again and i really hope we keep the dialogue going um, i'm going to put uh, a blog post together with this along with uh, the information about um the course that you're putting together i'd be really happy to to uh, promote that and talk about that some more. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, Nick. Have a fantastic Friday.